to the prophecy of Isaiah. And we're going to have this evening four Scripture readings just to link God's message this evening. And we're turning to Isaiah chapter 59, please, first of all. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 59. Chapter 59 of the prophecy of Isaiah. And verse number 1, we read these words. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. And then I want to come over just back a few pages to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, verse number 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then over into the New Testament for the third reading, John's Gospel Chapter number 8, please. John's Gospel, chapter number 8. John 8 and verse number 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. And whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself, because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, That ye shall die in your sins. For if ye... Believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. One final verse, back again to the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter number 1. Isaiah, chapter number 1. And it's verse 18 this time. Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18. And through the prophet, the Lord is saying, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And we know that the Lord will add His blessing upon those readings of His own precious truth. We live in a day, child of God, we live in a day where sickness can strike us down at any moment. My goodness, you could be the healthiest person today and be struck down with some deadly sickness tomorrow. You just you just don't know. You see, sickness tonight, sickness takes no prisoners, and sickness shows no mercy. A lady that Tracy knows, about a fortnight ago went into hospital feeling unwell. She was diagnosed with cancer, and today she's dead 
and bearing. They say your diet's important. Well, so it is, but yet it doesn't stop it. Keeping fit supposed to be the answer, but yet that doesn't stop it either. You see, sickness takes no prisoners. It hits the young as well as the old. It hits the rich as well as the poor. It hits the good as well as the bad. Bringing all the suffering and all the pain and even even death. You take today dementia, cancer, all these things, and none of us here tonight are sure that we will escape. Sickness tonight can get the grip of the healthiest of, peace, of people. But there's a worse sickness than cancer. There's a worse sickness than dementia. The Bible tonight calls it sin. And in these closing moments, God wants to speak to you tonight, dear unsaved friend, about your sin and about your soul. Not about your sickness and your body, but about your sin tonight and your soul. In Isaiah 59 this evening, verse number 2, we see there the personal effects of sin tonight. The great problem with the unsaved of today and the, and the great problem with the churchgoer and the great problem with the religious person and the great problem with the self-righteous person they fail to see the seriousness of sin. There's people who flock to churches every weekend, weekend in, weekend out, and they fail tonight to see the seriousness of sin. Religious but blind to the seriousness of sin. Because we're told here in Isaiah 59 and 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. If only tonight's sinners would understand tonight the seriousness of sin. You see, there's Sin's three-dimensional. Maybe you didn't know that tonight. Sin's three-dimensional. And today, people can only see the one dimension of sin tonight, and that's the pleasure of sin. Let me tell you tonight, there's pleasure in sin. Don't try and tell me tonight that there is no pleasure in sin. I'll tell you there's pleasure in sin. I've been there, I've done that, and I've got the T-shirt for it too. There's pleasure in sin. You walk up through the town there on a Saturday night. Many a time I've walked up past through the traffic lights, going for a wee dander on a Saturday night. And outside the club you'll see piles of young people laughing and gahoing all they can, blown out of their mind. They're not sad. They're happy to me. And that proves tonight that there's pleasure in sin. There's pleasure in the world. Sin's an attractive thing this evening. Know all about it. 
Because I used to frequent the discos and the dances. And there's many a night I come home out of my head because I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And people this evening, they, they see nothing, only the, the pleasure of sin. But then there's another dimension of sin, and that's the problem. The problem of sin is this, the pleasure of sin is just but for a season. I know that because I have experienced that, and I got the T-shirt for that too. I suddenly realized that sin could not scratch the itch in my heart. Sin could no longer satisfy the longing of my soul. There was something that I needed more that sin couldn't have or couldn't do. Do you know, friends, tonight the problem with sin? Sin this evening tonight is so pleasurable, it's hard for people to repent. And the pleasure of sin is but for a season. Vera Redpath was a young lady who was known for her, known for her beauty and her charm. She was highly educated and she was accomplished in her manners. She was a beauty. She was a daughter every parent would have been proud to have until she hit 20. When she became 20 years of age, Vera Redpath became a prostitute. And at the age of 22, she died a broken-hearted, friendless, down-and-out citizen. See, that's the way sin finally leaves you. Sin brings its shame. But never you mind about the pleasure of sin and the problem of sin. You think tonight of the great placing of sin because Isaiah tells us, your sin have hid his face from you. You may be a religious person, right? You may be a good person. You may be upright. And you may be this and you may be that and you may be the other thing. But God wants you to know tonight you're a sinner. And the sin that is within your heart tonight, let me tell you now, God hates it. Uh, Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 17, All these things I hate, saith the Lord. You may say to me, well, George, I have never drunk. I have never smoked. I have never been a bad person like Vera Redpath. I have never done those things. Well, the Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. There's a whole lot of church-going people in the kingdom of mourn tonight, and they're deceiving themselves. They believe they have no sin. But here's the personal effects of your sin tonight. They are separating you and God. They're coming between you and God tonight, and God is hiding His face from you. That's the personal, a fact from sin. Your worst nightmare, dear, is not dementia. Your worst nightmare, sir, is not cancer. Your worst nightmare is sin. And then I want us to think for a few moments on the powerful effects of sin because in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, we read this tonight, but he was wounded for our transgression. Your sin, my sin, our sin tonight affected one person. And that one person was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was the person who had no sin. But the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, that He was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus was the Lamb of God tonight, without spot and without blemish. 
What brought him down from heaven? You know what brought him down to heaven? Our sin. What made him go to Calvary tonight? Our sin. What put him to the cross tonight? Our sin. What did he bear on the cross? Our sin. That's what he bare on the cross. And sinners tonight are ignorant of their sin. They're more interested in their denomination, and they're more interested in their self-righteousness, and they're more interested in their religion tonight. But friend, our sin tonight put the Lord Jesus to the cross. God made him to be sin for us. And dear unsaved friend, this evening as I look at myself, and as I look to the Lord Jesus hanging there on Calvary's cross, I have to confess it was my sin that put him there, and it was your sin that put him to the cross. Oh, the Roman soldiers might have been there and have nailed him to the cross, but it was your sins. Peter says Christ once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And friend, when we consider the agonies and the sufferings and the pains of the cross tonight, that's the powerful effect that our sin had on the Lord Jesus. He was made sin for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And we read in Isaiah 53 that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Maximilian Kolbe was a Franciscan priest who was in the prisoner of war camp in Auschwitz. Ten men were selected to be executed and starved to death because of an escape camp. One man cried out, My wife, my children, my wife, my children. Maximilian Colby stepped forward and said, Let this man go. And he took his place. Maximilian Colby took the place of a stranger. When we visited Auschwitz a number of years ago, we saw the very cell he died in. They were crammed into this wee cubby hole of a place, and they were locked in there for two months, and they were starved to death. Such agony, such suffering, such pain, but Maximilian Colby went in and he died in a stranger's place. And yet, sinner friend tonight, I want to point you to Calvary and I want to see one, you to see one tonight who died in your place, who suffered and who bled and died in our guilty room instead, and it was all because of our sin. When he bore our sin upon his own body upon the tree, there he suffered the awful agony, not only of the cross, but of the very punishment of God, the personal effects of sin that separates you and God to me. The powerful effects of sin that the Lord Jesus was made sin for us and was punished. But here's the perilous effect of sin. The perilous effect of sin. And here's the perilous effect tonight. The Lord Jesus said, if you die in your sins, where I am, there ye cannot come. Unsaved people needs to be awakened to the seriousness of sin tonight. I hear more nonsense talked at wakes you want to hear a pile of nonsense talk, go you to awake, and you'll hear the biggest pile of nonsense talk at wakes. And you'll hear the more lies told at funerals than anywhere else. There's many a funeral to go to. Sometimes you need to have to go up and take a look on top of the coffin to see am I at the right funeral. Everybody's buried a Christian. Nobody's ever buried a lost soul. I know we can't judge anybody. But everybody's buried a Christian. Everybody's buried in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the dead. And I'll tell you, there's more lies told at funerals than told anywhere else. But let me tell you this, dear friend, I'm not up here to tell you a lie. And I'm not up here to fiddle around to make you feel good. God wants you to know tonight, He wants me to tell you, if you die in your sins this evening and not unsaved state of yours, 
you're going down to hell. And that's the perilous effect of your sin tonight. Doesn't matter how good living you are, or how religious you are, or how righteous you are. You're a sinner tonight. And you know, friend, tonight I hear a whole pile of nonsense. Ah, it's happy for him or it's happy for dead and sleep. What a way to go. It's the way everybody wants to go. But you know, friend, there's more to it than dying in your sleep. It's dying in your sin. The rich man in Luke 16 didn't die and go to hell because he was rich. He died and he went to hell because he died in sin. It's not the way you'll die. For if ye believe not that I am he, Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am the door by which if any man enters in, he shall be saved, you'll die in your sin. If you don't believe that I am the way, the truth, and the life, you'll die in your sin. If you don't believe that I am the good shepherd, that the good shepherd giveth us life for the sheep, you'll die in your sin, love. If you don't believe that I am he, Then Jesus himself said, You'll die in your sin. And where I am, there ye cannot come. But I want to finish tonight on a good note. And I want to finish on a glorious note. It's Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Because here's the precious effects on sin. And the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Thank God tonight there is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And if sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And you know, friend, this evening, what a wonderful thought that is, that there's cleansing tonight for the soul. That cleansing for the soul tonight is in the precious blood of the Lamb. The invitation is tonight, come now. Don't believe it the next week. Don't believe it till tomorrow night. Come now. And God says, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Why don't you come tonight and find forgiveness and find cleansing in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus? Your sin, your soul, the choice is you. Let's pray.